And good evening, everyone. ESS Empire State Sports proudly presents the Wise Guy Sports Talk Show. Your host for this evening, Joey Rio, I'm Dave Bartlett from an unknown disclosed location. And myself, Pete Kostma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our special guest, Kara Newtown. Welcome to the show, Kara. Thank you. Glad to be here. So I'm sure we're going to hit on a few things tonight, you know, local celebrity, and now you're with the – you're rocking and rolling over at Sam River Central uh, with the hockey team. Uh, we'll get in that momentarily because we want to talk about the ex exceptional run you had this year, but we'll wait on that for a little bit. Sounds good. Hey, Joey, take it away. All right, Kara. I want to thanks for, thanks for having you on tonight. We appreciate it. Right from uh, the deep woods of downtown North Lawrence. Yeah, internet's good. Uh, internet's good. You, you won't have any issues. Say that again. It, <laughs> internet's good there. We won't have any issues. <laughs> you know, when we first moved in, it took us about six months to get Wi-Fi, and that was a very trying time in our marriage. But we made it through. We got Wi-Fi, and here we are, going strong. Holy cow! Wi-Fi is a, a, a an issue in marriage now. Huh. <laughs> when you can't watch Netflix and you have to talk to each other, it's a huge problem. <laughs> Honey, the honeymoon's times over. Have, times, have, times have changed, Pete and Dave. I, did, I, never, <laughs> I never heard of the Wi-Fi defense. Yeah. So. <laughs> I wonder if that'll um, help. Before we, before we get started for our viewers tonight, Dave Bartlett is not – in fear of a uh, nuclear explosion, that's not a bunker that he is in. Uh, <laughs> he yeah. is he is at work, stuck at work, watering greens tonight. So, all right, Kara. Irrig so, our, our irrigation computer took a crap, and so means manually watering in order to keep keep the grass alive. Well, and that's uh, every golf course superintendent's dream, right? Is to be out watering right. greens. Yeah, when you started at 5 this morning, and now it's 7 p.m., and you're taking a break. <laughs> All right, so, Kara, why don't you give uh, give our viewers, uh, you're one of our younger coaches in the section now, kind of new to our area. Uh, we all know you, but probably not everybody that's been watching tonight knows you. So let's uh, give everybody a little rundown, your high school career, uh, where you went to college. We know, but they don't. So, and, and your accomplishments and – and we'll go from there, okay? You betcha. So um, I grew up in Scantlis, New York, um, spelled much differently than how you say it, so that can confuse a lot of people. So uh, both my parents grew up there. I grew up there. I wanted to go to prep school, but my parents said that my public high school was good enough. And then a year later, they sent my brother to private school. So <laughs> no hard feelings. I've accepted that he is the favorite child. And I've moved on. Um, at that time when I was um, in high school, we had a high school team, but it wasn't nearly what it is now in the state. So instead of playing high school, I played for the Syracuse Stars, which are now the Syracuse Nats. Um, and I played there from the time I was 12 all the way until I graduated. So that was um, AAA hockey. So the best hockey that you could play in the state. Um, and that was my first year that I played girls hockey. My parents said that I could play um, Syracuse Stars hockey if I played girls. And I was like under the impression, like, I don't want to play girls hockey. They're all like wimps. They wear pink. It's like, it's not going to be real hockey. And then I got on the ice with them that summer. And I was like, all right, I, I can do this. This will be fun. So from there, I've made a lot of lifelong friends. Uh, one girl that ended up playing Syracuse with Syracuse stars with when I was younger, I went to college with as well. And we're still friends. And so I always have the joke, like, you can't get rid of me. We're too invested now. Uh, with the Syracuse stars, we, um, won States every year, except for one year that I was there. And then when I was 14, we won nationals in Rochester, but I sadly do not remember it because 10 seconds into the game, I was hit from behind and suffered a concussion. So I had to be taken off the ice. I tried to go back to watch from the bench, but like all the moving was like making me 
very nauseous, so I had to get off the bench. So I know we won. Not really sure how we won, but we did. And then I had to drive back to Syracuse. Luckily, it was only in Rochester, so it was a short trip. Uh, other places we went to nationals. My first year, we went to nationals in Alaska, so that was really fun. Uh, we went to nationals in um, San Jose, Colorado, Rochester, and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Uh, so that was the only national championship that I was a part of when I was younger. And then when we were deciding um, where I wanted to go to school, I visited um, Clarkson, I visited Newman and Oswego and Plattsburgh, which I had never heard of until I started um, looking for schools. I went up to Plattsburgh and I rode home the whole way crying, saying, I don't want to go to Plattsburgh. I want to go to Newman. My dad and I argued for six hours back to Skinny Atlas, and I picked to go to Plattsburgh. You know, he made a compelling case, and uh, I don't regret one moment of going to Plattsburgh. So then I show up at Plattsburgh, and I end up being a starter right off as a freshman, which was scary. I had a senior for a D partner, so I was very nervous to, like, make any mistakes. They had just won a national championship the year before. And so um, I had to get over that. I ended up being on PK. I started, I think, almost every game that year as a freshman. And then we ended up winning a national championship in Plattsburgh that year. And that was absolutely amazing. One of the best feelings ever, um, especially winning against Manhattanville, which broke our win streak earlier that year. So it was kind of like a little redemption. And so that was awesome. And just like, I don't remember much of the spring from that semester because, you know, we we're just living on this high of winning a national championship. Um, and it was the only one, unfortunately, that I won at Plattsburgh, whereas a lot of the girls that have come after have won like four in a row, three in a row. But I'm super happy to have that one under my belt in, in my um, career. Um, my junior year, I ended up getting my um, first All-American with um, 11 assists, zero goals, or was it, no, 19 assists, zero goals. So I've never been a good goal scorer. It's always, you know, a running joke. My brother um, went to Wesleyan and played hockey there, and he was a standout forward. You know, he'd get hat tricks, and he ended up getting like 100 points in his career by his junior year, I think. and. I, I was lucky if I got one goal in a season, but I made up for an assist. And then um, my senior year, I got All-American again. I got um, SUNYAC All-Academic. So it was always stressed in my family that we're student athletes. And it was the same way at Plattsburgh. You're a student first, and then you're an athlete. You do your job in the classroom, and then you're able to do your job on the ice. Um, and then I got... Um, female athlete of the year for Plattsburgh on the whole campus. Um, I got team MVP and um, some SUNYAC awards as well. So a very good career. Um, hockey's always been a big part of my life. I started skating when I was two, so I'm hoping that my daughter Bennett learns to walk soon so I can get her on the ice this winter. Um, she'll only be like one and a half, but it's never too early. You know, every night we uh, read, you know, the hockey alphabet or good night hockey, just to make sure she understands that that's her future. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I end up going to work at a prep school in New Hampshire called New Hampton. Um, at this prep school, I was able um, to coach a team that Kayla Barnes was on, who is now an Olympian. So very good girls there. Um, learned a lot about um, coaching, what kind of coach I want to be. And then I came back to the North Country, determined to find a job. And that's when Salmon had an opening. And I was like, this place is pretty sweet. They have a rink attached to their school, so I won't need to walk far to get to practice. And um, that first year I was an assistant coach volunteer. And then from there, 
I um, coached, assistant coach with Olivia Cook for two more years, and then she left to pursue. Um, uh, she actually went to Australia this past year to play professional women's hockey there. And I ended up taking over the team. And here we are today. So that's really a quick uh, snapshot of my 30 years in the arena. Well, a, a few things I'll just uh, feed off of that. First of all, uh, when you got the same river, was it was it Jim Barnes that you were assisting there, or who was it? Who was the coach there when you first got there? Uh, it was actually Olivia Cook. She the year before had taken over the program from Jim. Okay. And then um, the year I was, it was her second year when I was there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another thing, my father always used to say something about people that do assist. You said he didn't make very many goalie goals, but. Oh no! Well, it was a, a running joke. Um, so at Plattsburgh, when you scored your first goal of your career, you'd get a puck and then you put tape around it and say like when you scored it, what the score was, and your first collegiate goal. And I actually do that with my girls now at Salmon when they score their first varsity goal. We wrap it up so they have that memento. And um, during preseason, they wrapped a puck up for me because I hadn't scored in like two years. And they wrapped a puck up for me as a big joke that like, hey, here you go, Bueller, because we know you won't score during the season. So it, running joke in my family, in my team, everywhere. My, my father used to say that somebody had to score with those assists in mind. So the, just my father used to say the assists are just as good as points. So uh, that, I'll just put it out that out there. So, but definitely, you, I had, agree with you. Pete. Oh yeah, you've had you've had an amazing career. Um, uh, I, I'm 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 kind of shocked that Skinny Atlas actually didn't have a team. Uh, I mean, they're right there in the Sun Belt. I I've been stranded in Skinny Atlas in the snowstorms. I had to I had to, It's a long story, but I had to take the the train there from Skinny Atlas all the way back to Poughkeepsie uh, during one of those storms. So I know exactly uh, what go, but I'm very, I, I can't believe Skinny Atlas doesn't have a team. That's, that amazes me. They, they had, they were just getting one, I think my junior year, but it was at like, it wasn't at the caliber that it's at now. Now Skinny Atlas is one of the top teams in the state pretty consecutively. Um, and my parents were worried that if I played down a level at that time, then I'd get into bad habits. And then when I went and played at a higher level, I think that I had these great hands and I actually really don't have great hands for deking and stuff. And uh, so we just stuck with Syracuse, but they, uh, man, I think I would miss almost every Friday of school pretty much during hockey season. Just the with tournaments going everywhere. My parents were never in the same place for for months because my brother played travel as well. So uh, I might be in Michigan, and then they would be in Massachusetts. Or there was one time where uh, Keith was in Michigan, and I think I was in Colorado. So like we were never like, in the same place often. Well, and, and, it, and I was surprised when you said that at that time that you were there, Skinny Atlas didn't have a girls team. Um, it, their boys program has been strong for, for years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was 2000, I want to say 2017, 16 or 17. I think it was 17. That our, uh, our boys went to the state final four and had to beat Skinny Atlas at Skinny Atlas mm -hmm. to do that. And uh, so I was there in their rink. I was able to see your hometown rink and uh, um, experience. Uh, and it, it certainly felt like a big time hockey school, big time hockey community. Yes, yes, absolutely. There's my parents have told me stories of how, so the rink that we were at, the YMCA, way warmer than the rink that I skated on when I was younger, the Allen Arena. And that was like, it just had tarps on the walls. So imagine like a little five-year-old at like, you know, <laughs> 6 a.m. or something getting on the ice and your feet, you know, freezing. So we would always um, put baby powder in our skates because your, your feet sweat and then that sweat 
freezes because it's so cold. And so the baby powder helps take out that moisture so that you wouldn't have little five-year-olds coming off the ice crying because they couldn't feel their feet. Little tricks, a little trick of the yeah. trade there, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah, um, my coaching bag, I always pack some baby powder for when we go to places like mm, Chazy, for instance, that oh, yeah. is literally a pole barn in the middle That's of the woods. Outdoor, yep. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. if, if you ask around some of the, well, if you ask uh, Tim Cook, um, who is the boys hockey coach at Sam River, uh, he'll tell you that Skinny Atlas has been a thorn in Sam River's th side for years. Oh. Uh, always met them at some point in, in the state playoffs and always had to get over the hump of Skinny Atlas in order to to uh, win state. So Skinny Atlas does have a great program, and that's what shocked me when you said that they didn't have a girls program. It's like, wow, I, I, hard to believe. Yeah. And I think, I think it was 1989. Um, I think Skinny Atlas and Salmon, I think, split a state championship. For hockey, I think it was for some. It was one of those years, but I can't unknown. remember. Yeah. You'll to, yeah, you'll have to fact check me on that. But I believe they ended up splitting at one time a state championship. So, yeah, so I literally went from a very hockey oriented high school to a very hockey oriented college to a very hockey oriented um, job. So, when you won your uh, national championship with, Pl with Plattsburgh State, was was the final four or the frozen four itself, was it right at Plattsburgh? Were you the hosts? Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, wow. So, yep. did, do, so did you guys, uh, no, now not winning one the other three years of your career, what, what happened to you guys in those three seasons? Did you, uh, did you get out of the SUNYACs? Did you – uh advance at all in the ncas in those years and, and if so did where did you travel to we um things were different back then so they didn't have a suniac for the girls they had the ecac um west i east or west ecacs and so we had to play team um rit is a thorn in our side Right now they're D1, but they had to, I think, prove themselves as D3 and then move up to D1. So we would face them, or Elmira, um, every year in the ECACs, and I never won one ECAC. When we won national championship, we didn't win the ECAC either. We ended up getting a bid into it. And then we won that game, and then we ended up being able to host because we were the highest seed throughout the year. Um, in other years, we had to go down to Amherst and play down there in the NCAA, and we lost down there. Um, we had to go to RIT my senior year to play in um, the UCAC championship game, and we ended up losing there. And so it was a familiar feeling by that point, like losing, and then you'd have to wait for the show to come on the next morning, I think at like 10 o'clock to say which teams got the bids uh, and which teams would be advancing. And we didn't, we ended up not getting it. And so that was the end of my career at Plattsburgh. You know, you, you mentioned, it, this just came to mind while you were talking about this, but you mentioned the, the little tricks of the trade and, uh, I don't know. I know Pete and Dave and I were kind of – I was watching, and I know we were messaging last night. So did you watch any of the five-overtime game last oh night? Oh, my God. No, Tampa I Bay didn't. So, but I uh... – So I got so I to ask you this. So I heard today – I'm listening on radio, and what a great night for the National Hockey League. And as a guy that listens to sports radio constantly, they don't talk about – National Hockey League on sports radio. They just don't. And whether you like that or not, that's a fact. But today, they talked about it because of the game last night. So I heard a story today about what happens in a game that goes that long. And Rick DiPietro, who used to play for the New York Islanders, he went to school at Boston University, played in one of the longest college hockey games ever. And he was describing how in the fourth as he's sitting waiting for the fourth overtime to begin, he's the goalie and how 
you know, the pad, he is just drenched oh, in sweat at oh, this point. His pads are, he now weighs 20 pounds heavier than he started. Mm -hmm. But he mentioned taking off, because of the wool socks, he mentioned taking off his skate and like pouring the water out of his skate. Like his feet hadn't frozen, the sweat had all gotten in there. Is it? So is that a difference in between the super duper duper really cold rinks that we play in as compared to the rinks that they're playing in? Absolutely. Even when I go to NHL games, I'm like, I first off, winter is my favorite. I love when we get huge snowstorms and it's negative 30 out. I, I love it. I love skating outside. I went to um, my college teammates and I still get together for hockey tournaments. And one was in Lake Placid on Mirror Lake. It was an outdoor tournament. And you know, Lake Placid gets freezing. And so we had to, you know, put the baby powder in our skates and the Vaseline on our face so that we wouldn't get um, that wind burn. And man, it's amazing when it's cold. So when I go into those NHL rings, I'm like dying. It's just so hot. And what happens is the ice gets so soft. It's hard to, it's, you have to work a lot harder to skate. When the, when the ice is uh, very hard or outdoor ice, it's like one stride, you're like, zoom, down the ice. So if I had to choose, I'd rather have hard ice any day besides that soft, warm. So I definitely get that in like your equipment. There's nothing worse than like if you have to, I mean, five overtimes, I would imagine that I would probably have to go to the bathroom out of like nerves or something like that. And there's nothing worse than taking off your elbow guards or your shin pads and then having to put them back on when they're soaked. It's just, it never feels the same. It's just like, oh, it's irritating. So five overtimes, insane. And I think that a lot of times when you go into those overtimes, I've, I've had to coach through a few of those overtimes. And it's hard as a coach because you can't, like you, I tell the girls, like, I'd rather be playing because at least I can control something. Like, as a coach, I can only encourage you to go do what you need to do. I can't, you know, move the puck from D to D and up. I can't, like, dump it or, or whatever. And what happens during those long games is it's not necessarily exhaustion, but it's, like, mental mistakes start happening. You know, stuff that you usually do really good, you're, like, you just can't do it anymore. You just make silly mistakes that you never would in a regular basis because you're just mentally exhausted. Hockey is such a fast sport. You don't have time to think things through a lot. I always tell the girls like you need to know before you get the puck, you need to have three different options figured out for when you get the puck that you can, you know, pass to your wing, skate it, dump it, whatever. But you need to have those options figured out before you get the puck, not when you get the puck by then it's too late. At that point of the, like a five overtime, you mentally you're tired, but physically you're tired and you're probably about a half a second slower and mm -hmm. you think you're going to do something that's, that's second nature to you. And, and yeah, that's like you said, you end up making a mistake and that's, that's usually the difference. And I don't know if like, you know, well, I'm sure the NHL, um, players are also superstitious but like if something was wrong with my skate let's say it got a little loose or something like it would take a lot in me to undo that skate and then tie it back up in the middle of a game like even when I get dressed I always put on my right skate first and then I put on my left skate like I never go left to right it just I feel like it just throws me off you know and then I always like I don't like to be hot when I play so I don't like have long sleeves on unless, you know, I'm playing in Brazier during pickup league or something and I need it. And it's just like so many things that you don't want to change, even though it might be uncomfortable. It's just that superstition is so high. I want to be able to do it. And then they say like when um, I was reading today that some people were like, well, should the NHL get rid of so many overtimes? And they're like, should it go four on four, three on three? And it's, that's a lot, that's a lot of ice for three on three. That's a lot of skating. And it just changes the game. You don't hear many people say like, oh, well, if the major league goes into extra innings, they should get rid of an outfielder and get rid of, rid of an infielder. So, you know, hockey shouldn't be any different. You use, you know, we're switching every 30 to 45 seconds and it's, you're essentially sprinting on your shifts. You're not taking you know, time off and then to take players off the ice changes the whole game. Yeah, no, Kara, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that 
what they do in the regular season, I, I could care less. Actually, I, I, I'm fine with a tie. I don't even I don't even need to see the three minutes of three on three or the shootout. But when it comes to playoff hockey, you, you have to finish the game the way it's meant to be played. And if it takes five overtimes, it takes five overtimes. It had yeah. me watch. I mean, I was going to watch last night anyway because Derek Cologne is, is the assistant coach for Tampa Bay. But that game, if it didn't involve Derek and I got wind of a of a third, fourth overtime hockey game, I'm turning to it. I'm going to watch that, no, whether I've mm-hmm. got a dog in the fight or not. That's 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 the hockey I want to see. Absolutely. And after the NHL took that year off due to like contract negotiations or whatever, they really had to think of how to, you know, get the fans back and to make the game exciting to watch. And I think they've done a good job, and especially with this playoff format. I think they've really thought things through and how to give fans an exciting season amidst all the stuff that's going on outside of the arena and in the world. I, what, what I thought, this goes, I get weird stuff that goes from my head and, and guys and people that know me know understand why, but what, one of the things I was thinking last night watching that hockey game going, I feel sorry for these equipment kids or equipment guys that, you know, but you know, the middle of the third period, they're probably going, okay, we, we can start packing stuff up now. And then, Oh, wait a minute, we're going to overtime. And then, okay, okay let's, let's start packing back up. I mean, they, I don't know how many towels they had to hand out last night when they got in the locker room, but there must have been quite a few. So I, I feel sorry for the, the equipment guys last night. They going to be up and down uh, all night. Absolutely. Yeah, crazy. Uh, <laughs> just a crazy game, but – um, you know, as Derek said when we had him on earlier, he thought that the NHL was hitting a home run with, with this bubble format and uh, middle of summer. We got nothing else to do right now. And I just got done before before I popped on here, I just got done watching the Islander game. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe you're watching hockey in the middle of August at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, but you're, you're mm-hmm. able to right now. So um, what about uh, – so you said that you were the Plattsburgh State Female Athlete of the Year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, talk, talk, talk a little bit about that. That's kind of cool. Uh, so I had no idea. Um, Plattsburgh at the end of the year does a senior sports banquet and where they give out all these awards. Um, and that was one of them. And I was, I didn't even know I was in the running. I mean, we have so many sports at Plattsburgh, soccer and cross country and a lot of successful teams. And I wasn't a captain or anything. And I wasn't a high goal scorer. So I was very surprised, uh, to get that award as well as some other awards. So that's, that's another thing, you know, that I tell my girls is that it doesn't matter if you're the high scorer or you get more assists than goals because people are going to notice your hard work and a lot of stuff that you do on the ice, whether it's stopping a two on one or making the extra pass, like that makes those plays happen. It's not always the goal scorer. The person who scores the goals wouldn't have been able to do it if, play before had it turned out the way it did you might not get credit for it but everyone saw it develop and so I was definitely very surprised um, to get that award those are the best awards when yeah. when, when they come as a surprise to you those are the best um, all right, so let's let's dive in. Let the make these two Salmon River boys happy. Let's talk a little Salmon River, <laughs> Salmon River uh, girls hockey, and in your your run to the Final Four this year. I was at the Section Ten Championship game and a game that you had to hang on. Uh, oh, it felt like it stressful. felt like yeah, it felt like you guys were gonna just pull away and win easily. But Potsdam fought back, made it a had a point blank shot to tie it late in the game. It was uh, it was really exciting. So. Go ahead, talk about your season and, and our hopeful upcoming season and uh, and what, what you're planning on for, for the future. So um, this season, 
was absolutely insane. Um, it might have looked on paper like we had everything together, like, oh, we're the perfect team. But from day two, we had problems. Um, and that problem originated with me because on October 18th, I gave birth to our daughter and I was out on maternity leave. But season started November 11th. And so um, I was under the impression that I would be able to, you know, come back and coach while still taking maternity leave. But that was an absolute no-go. So after the first practice, um, I was in the rink. I left Ben at home. She was a month old. I was, like, sleep-deprived and, like, still recovering from giving birth. And now I find out that I'm not allowed in the locker room or on the ice or on the bench um, with these girls that I've had since they were freshmen. So, I mean, these aren't just, you know, like new girls that I don't know. I've seen these kids grow up and now they're telling me that I can't be there for the beginning of the season. And so luckily Hayden, uh, Boyu, who's a Brazier boy, uh, took over and Hayden, I think is like, I don't know, 26. And now he's in charge of all these teenage girls who, um, shocking but girls are much different than boys oh, yeah. and um <laughs> he had to try to figure out how to manage these girls and the girls were under the impression that i was going to be back so now from day two we're thrown this curveball that i can't be on the ice i can't be on the bench can't be like in the locker room nowhere like that and so that led to a lot of communication between me and Hayden. Um, I would purposely text him at, you know, 2 a.m., 4 a.m. when I was feeding Bennett. And he's like, I hear my phone going off and who else but you sending me uh, practice plans or stuff that I should think about or what we need to do, but like getting out jerseys, doing fundraising, making sure that we have approval for an overnight trip, all this stuff. Um, so up until the week before Christmas, and I was going to take all the way till the new year off for my maternity leave, but I ended up coming back a week early. Um, and it came from a lot of communication between me and Hayden. And even um, between periods at games, we went to every single game. I think I only missed one game in Shay-Z. I think Brian was working and Jay-Z again is freezing. So I wasn't going to take my two month old to Shay-Z, um, just a little too cold for her there. And um, he was able to um, pull the girls together and we just kept winning um, through uh, lots of adversity in school, in the locker room, but we were able to just keep going. And that's the thing that I remind the girls about hockey is that when you walk through that locker room, like everything else stops, like you're here, you should be having fun. Like hockey should mean something to you. And if hockey doesn't make you happy, then something's wrong because there should never be a time where you feel like hockey's a job or you don't want to go to the arena and be with your teammates. The same thing, I've had the same thing happen at Plattsburgh my freshman year. There was like the team was split in two, and, but we were still able to come together on the ice. We left everything at the door because we had a common goal. And so um, – and then when I came back, I was super nervous because I was like, Hayden has won every single game. What if I come back and coach for the first day and then we lose? And then what's that mm -hmm. like? So I was super nervous, um, but we kept on winning. And it was never our, our goal to go undefeated. It just happened. We never went in the locker room and said, all right, girls, like we're on a 20-game win streak. We need to win just one more game. We never brought it up. We all knew it. What we were doing was awesome and incredible, but we never, we never brought it up. We just, we would always tell them, um, just go out and do what you know uh, you need to do. We practice during the week doing this stuff. Um, one of my um, things as a coach is we use a lot of the same drills so that we can move through them fast and we have names for those drills. So, I'll, you know, I'll shout out double regroup and we know what to do. I'll shout out, um, Gretzky curl and we'll know what to do, whatever the drill is. Um, because I'm also a firm believer that practice doesn't make perfect, but practice makes permanent. So if we keep 
working our D2D regrouping passes, then in a game, it's just going to come naturally to us. And it's going to just be that muscle memory. Um, and then, you know, we get in those games against Potsdam. And those are stressful in itself. Like there's a high rivalry between us over the past few years. Um, and then it all comes to that section 10 game where we have to now beat Potsdam again in order to win. And you can beat a team once, you might be able to do it twice, but like that third time, that's asking a lot. And we're in um, at SUNY Potsdam, which is a different arena than we've played at before. Um, and it's a different day of the week that we usually play out. Like it just like lots of different factors in for our girls and our team, like consistency and schedule is like a big key to us playing the way we need to play. Um, and so, oh my God, in that game, we get up, we have more. One of the things that made us so good was that I didn't need to depend on one person to score goals. I had numerous girls that could score goals. It just depended on what night it was. And man, and we knew, we knew that once we got up, we had to watch Kennedy because that was like their secret weapon. Kennedy, if anyone was going to win this game, it was going to be Kennedy Emerson. And it was stressful to say the least. Like I still see that last shot she took with like a few seconds left that rings off the top crossbar. Like she had it. If a half, a, half an inch lower, we would have gone into overtime. And I don't know how that would have turned out. Um, another thing about that game, and another thing that I love about Salmon is like the crowd support. Um, even when we went to States for the first time when I was coaching in Oswego, um, we had more people there than any other team that was closer, you know, any team in Canales or Buffalo, which were um, a little bit closer than us. And that's an, the same thing at Potsdam. You would have thought that we were playing in Salmon because when you looked up at that stands, you saw green everywhere. I don't even know if we left any room for those Potsdam sandstorm or ugly colors. You know, we made it look nice and pretty with that green. Well, I, so we, that was you. You fell into a school with a long history of hockey, um, and for many moons, and Dave can attest to this back when we were playing. We were both high, uh, basketball players, but when there was something going down the arena, we went. And they followed us, oh, yeah. we followed them. When they went to States, we followed them, we went to bus. Um, and St. Lawrence, Lawrence Central is the same way, Joey can attest to that. But the North Country, when it comes to their hockey, they're very serious about it, and they follow their teams around. Um, one other thing I want to say, um, and I really don't want to call kids out, but I, I got to put a plug in for one girl that was on your team for five years in between the pipes. That's Carly Karchak. Uh, um, yes. Uh, yeah, give us a little insight on her because she is a phenomenal goalie. Um, uh, she's all over the place, um, but she is a very steady, steady player. So if you just, just give a shout out to her. I know there's plenty of other girls, but I just, I happen to follow the car chase since they were kids. Yes. Yeah, so Carly um, was our goalie for um, when she was in eighth grade. So in eighth grade, she's going up against, you know, the seniors. And that first year, we were losing games by a lot, uh, losing games a lot to Canton and Messina, everyone, really. Um, and that for a goalie is really mentally challenging. And she was just so young. So I remember like trying to talk to her and she was just like, imagine like kind of a turtle in like their shell, like just kind of like staring at you a little. And just to see the transformation between that shy individual to now the senior who is speaking up more, being a leader on the team and just like killing it between the pipes. She... In that, um, in that game that we ended up losing to Clinton at States, that, if that was a direct shot, she had it. The only time you ever scored on Carly is if it was just like a weird bounce or something like that. You would rarely ever score on her point blank. And that came from um, her parents' support, 
playing um, uh, club hockey. Uh, she was always on the ice, always on the ice. Um, she used to have, oh, she, for one year, she had this terrible glove. It's like whenever you shot at her glove, the puck would just like bounce out. Like no matter how much she worked it, tied it in rubber bands, slept on it underneath her mattress, always the puck would just like bounce off. So we ended up going to Plattsburgh um, to play them and Carly doesn't have her glove. And we have no backup goalie at, at this time and we also have no glove. So luckily, um, the boys' Plattsburgh hockey team was also in the arena, and so they, we were able to borrow um, their varsity glaze glove. And I, mar we almost stole it because it was just it. She caught that puck so easily in that game, and no rebounds off, and she played amazing. And we're like Carly, we need to steal this. Like, does, let's who's back? Can we put it in? You think we can sneak out of this arena with this glove? Um, and she's always been such a good sport. She's funny. She always comes um, up with these, you know, jokes at a time where you need to just lighten it up. We, um, in our locker room, we started like a quote wall in the office and she's up there quite a bit for stuff that she says that you're just like, where did this come from? So she will definitely, she's a big piece of the puzzle that will be missed for next year. Um, but we do feel blessed that we have another goalie and we're not just going to be uh, pulling someone out and being like, here, play hockey goalie. It's, it's a piece of cake. You'll do fine. Um, so so give, it, Cara, give us a little insight on what your upcoming year looks like uh, for Salmon. Uh, we have a huge year. We have so we have a huge junior class, or well, now a senior class, and so I will be absolutely heartbroken if we don't get in some sort of a season because these girls, again, these are girls that I've had for five years that I've seen like grow up in front of my eyes. I, they, these girls were the first class that I taught at Salmon, um, Kayla Cunningham. I had her as a seventh grader. And so I've seen her over the past six years grow into this amazing young woman. And I just, I would feel heartbroken if they weren't able to get a season. And I think that this is going to be a big season for us. And then, um, then we'll have to see what girls we have, but every year it's, it's different. We have a lot of kids that, um, that sometimes transfer to salmon either from Messina or from the Canadian side. So every year it's kind of like, ah, oh, who do we have that plays hockey that would like to uh, come play with us and be a part of Shamrock hockey. Um, a large part of our success has also been from Tim Cook. A lot of um, programs might have like girls in uh girls hockey coach and guys hockey coach like fighting or like we deserve this you get this and we don't get this but I'll tell you what Tim Cook is an amazing guy who helped who has helped us out um over the past five years um getting Dennis to broadcast our games you know um hooking us up with him helping me make coaching decisions uh he has a lot of experience helping me with fundraising um, he runs a 3v3 tournament at the beginning of the year on our ice to just get the kids on the ice. Um, and our Zamboni, our rink manager, Gump, has a trophy, and the kids just absolutely love yeah. it. So he, I think, also has helped our program get to where it is just by being such a great mentor to me. And he'll always tell you, I remember when I interviewed you for the first time and I said, that girl belongs in global history in the high school. And I tell Tim, like, I don't want to go to the high school. I'm very happy in the middle school. Like, don't pull me up there. I I'm good. You know, Bueller, you should really be in the high school. No, 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 Tim. It's fine. Let it be. Let it be. So if I can ask you a question, is the zoo crew still around? You, do you there know is, the I think there's a few of them. Do you know the history of the zoo crew? I don't. I'd love to hear it if you oh, well, got a few minutes to tell me. If you're, if you're looking toward the end of the arena where the Zamboni room is, on the, yep. the left-hand side of that, in that corner, 
there's a bunch of guys that used to hang out called the Zoo Crew. And they were, they were, they were students that, and, and Gump was one of them. So you're going to have to talk to Gump. He was one of the original Zoo Crew guys. Uh, he'll give you quite the history, um, as, as of course, as Gump would uh, always does. But anyway. Um, but, oh, yeah. yeah. So, he, um, yeah, you got to talk to him about the Zoo Crew. You really do. Oh, I, I definitely, when I go, I will definitely find him out there. He's a... Uh, He's on lawn mowing duty, which I know is not nearly as much fun as maintaining the rink and laying down the ice, but I'll definitely have to see how he's doing. I know he's probably wearing his Boston Bruins attire proudly. Oh, yeah. um, I think tears came to his eyes when I brought Bennett to the rink with a Boston Bruins hat on once. He was just, you know, taken aback. Like, he's a great, he's a huge supporter. The kids love him, and that just goes to show, like, the culture of hockey that's at Salmon. Just that that community support in school and out in the community to help. And it really, like, if these girls and kids don't go anywhere to play college hockey and get that feeling, I feel like they have gotten such a great experience being at Salmon and playing in front of very large crowds for high school hockey. Well, holy cow, Kara, this hour flew by. <laughs> Are you tired? I'm tired listening to you. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's great. We usually I'm, sometimes I'm we have, sometimes we have to drag it out of uh, drag it out of people that come on, but boy, we like talking. Joey, did you say you're tired? You're, you're tired from listening or tired of listening to her? Oh, I'm never tired of listening to it. Okay, listen from, to okay. You know, we could do an overtime just like the NHL did. <laughs> oh, boy. Guys, guys, there's no overtime? No overtime. Well, Kara, thank, thanks for coming on. We appreciate it. And, uh, you know, I, here's hoping as a fellow coach and uh, athletic director that you get your season this year. We're all hoping for that. Um hopefully the right way and not a shortened one. But if it's a shortened one right now, I, I would take that. I, I, me, I need, no, me, I think, what is North I, country going to do without hockey? Yeah. I, I think we all need something and we need it pretty soon. So yeah. mm -hmm. here's hoping that uh, there will be Salmon River girls hockey this year. Yeah. Definitely. Thank Good you. Luck. Thanks. Good luck, Kara. Thanks for coming on the program. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, that's going to be it tonight for ESS Empire State Sports and the Wise Guy Sports Talk Show. Joey Riom, Dave Bartlett, myself, thanking our special guest, Kara Newtown, on the Santa River Girls Varsity Hockey Team. Thanks, Kara. And good night, everybody, and stay safe.